I have to believe uh, that the audience comes into the theatre uh, with, as Samuel Taylor, Taylor Coleridge said, with a willing suspension of disbelief. That they come to the theatre because they are willing to believe anything they see. That's what they come there for. So therefore, I must make everything I do believable to them. So that immediately there is a, a bond of mutual trust that I am not going to betray their belief. And if they know that I'm, they're not, their belief is not going to be betrayed, they will be comfortable and friendly, warm. Audiences do have... Yes, go ahead, sorry. You want to... You that the journey that you will take them on, or the you will, journey that you will go together with the play or with the character, will always uh, be a journey that they can take, that you will never uh, take them to a place they're not prepared to go. Is that what you mean? I will never... Yes, in a way. Uh, that's, that's a slightly broader picture, but it's a good picture. Um, the narrower picture is that I won't do anything on stage that bewilders them. Why did he do that? They will understand what I'm doing. Right. Uh, maybe it's called being in the moment with them. Uh, encourage them to come into the moment. I've often believed that, believed that, you know, that, that acting is the art of being private in public. But that's just a, a catchphrase, that's a, a, that really. Uh, but what it does mean is that you're being private, but you're allowing them to have a peek. Mm -hmm. And they feel privileged that at least they're allowed to see the window open slightly, sometimes quite broadly. Uh, another thing is... Uh, I don't think I have ever been afraid of an audience. In my early career, uh, like everybody else, I was nervous. Uh, Do you mean, you mean, in, you're not meaning stage fright or s nerves before a performance? I'm saying I do, I did go through all that, but I've never been afraid of an audience. Right. So I think that you, you not having fear is something about the, what I would call the marriage between the particular unique marriage you yeah. seem to have with your, with the people mm -hmm. who come to see the play. Because you think of a, if a performer is afraid of the audience, then they are driven to do certain things. They're driven to overact or overwork or do something crazy to, so they can cope with their fear. But what they're doing is putting a barrier between themselves and mm -hmm. the story mm -hmm. and the audience. And there's another thing too, if you actually think in terms of what, what goes on between 8 and 11 every night you're on stage. What goes on? You go out and for three hours of your life you know exactly what you're going to say, you know who you're going to say it to, you know every move you're going to make, every teacup you're going to pick up, every teacup you're going to put down, you know everything you're going to do for three hours. You're totally safe. In other words, you're at home. But the and fear so you're welcoming them into your home. Right. That's, and I get home and I feel a stranger. Because so when, I, when I see you step out on the, on the festival stage, it's as if you're stepping into the, on the lug, on the, onto the rug of your living room. That's what I actually feel. I feel that about most theaters. I felt that way in the theater in, in, in Soul Pepper for the two years I played with them. So that means the the performing platform is your home. Yes. I saw you on stage before I ever met you, mm -hmm. and I think it was Eno Barbus in Trials of Cressida. I think it's the first time I ever saw you, and I was oh. And then I was at university at, at Hart House, and you directed on Dean. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, exactly. And I was a student, and I was in on Dean, and yes, I, I had a very small part or whatever, whatever. I can't remember the Lord Chamber or something. And there was something about some business around the throne and moving behind the throne. And 
I remember you trying to describe, and I wasn't, I was just watching. You were trying to describe to the actors how to do it, and they tried, and then you described again, and you tried, and then you finally said, look, it's this way. And I remember you standing up and doing the move with the chair and the line. And I remember to this day being struck by the timing of it, mm. by how it was placed that it became crystal clear and funny. And I thought, and I was naive and young, I thought, mm -hmm. how did he do that? And ever since I've wanted to understand how this clarity of timing, using time, and the precision, where, where that comes from. I want you to ask me two questions. The first question I want to, you to ask me is, I understand you are one of the great comedians, uh, stage comedians of the world. And I will say yes. I and understand. Now, wait a second. Okay. And the second question is, I want, to under, I want to know how it is that you can, and you can finish the sentence. I understand that you're one of the great stage comedians of the world. Yes. I want to understand how... Timing! <laughs> so, where does that come from? Did you, did you see it in other people? Did it come out of your skin? First of all, uh, you have to have a, a, a very sound musical sense. Doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you're a musician or you can necessarily play an instrument. It does mean you have to be able to carry a tune, even though you've got a bad voice, but you have enough s musical sense that you can carry a tune, however badly the voice may, may, may reproduce it.